I've already recorded this once today, but technology makes me do this again. So this is take two. Still June 24th, still Babbitt Babbitt speaking, Kunta Anders on Promethean Shame. That's the slide. Once again. And the <clears throat> thing to be kept in mind is that this a text appears, it's the first time English translation in Christopher John Muller's Prometheanism, uh, which came out with Volman and Littlefield and has a subtitle, Technology, Digital Culture and Human Obsolescence. Now, Human Obsolescence is also one of the ways that one translates Gunther Anders' 1956 book from which this text is taken. Now, <clears throat> what I'd like to do, I think it necessary to try to start is just to give a sense of rhythmics because that's really part of this. If only I were one of you, I'd no longer be ashamed. I'd happily learn to enjoy my eternal return. I'd run on an appointed course attuned to machines. I'd do the same as yesterday, tomorrow the same again. No one would know who I am. No one would find out either who, in dark beginnings, my parents were. No one would know how I lay small in mother's lap after swimming like a fish that as a bloody lump of clay my life on earth began. If only I'd have glowed in the often and being made by things, so as to spring among your ranks with an armor-plated disposition. <clears throat> There's a meter there, and I argue that's patterned on Gunther Anders' not quite successful Molossian catacombs with regard to a particular nation, Molossia, and what it did and what it did not do. And here we see a sense of that, but we don't get the rhythmic, we don't get the music. That's another topic, but it's something to keep in mind because it comes back again a little later. Now, Christopher John Muller, who does that translation for us, gives us also an introductory essay, and he has several chapters in the book itself. He tells us at the start that On Promethean Shame op opens with four diary entries, and, and it's helpful because you really don't know where he's coming from, that establish the immediate context from which the text emerged, the American exile that Gunther Anders began in 1936 and which lasted until 1949. In light of the thematic trajectory of the remainder of this book, it's highly fitting that the setting of the essay is California, the very place that's at the center of innovations in computing and digital technology that are shaping the present in ever more powerful ways. Of course, the reference there is to Silicon Valley. <clears throat> he also very kindly cites my own text, which does not happen all the time, so I am grateful for that, where he says, quoting my O Superman or being towards transhumanism, that Anders' most dissonant insight, vying with anything Levinas argues about the face, with anything Heidegger argues about death and swordiness, and everything that Hannah Arendt writes about natality being born, is that the whole of our problem with modernity, which means starting with Descartes, uh, begins and ends with our awful shame at having been born. Now, the focus there is that Descartes, the father of modern philosophy, so modernity is to a certain extent indebted to Descartes. So our sh awful shame at having been born. That's a reference on the one hand to Levinas, the humanism of the other. We saw that also emphasized in David Gunkel's text. And face to face with animals, <clears throat> Levinas and the animal question, like Gunkel's the machine question, we get intriguingly with Peter Atterton and Tambor writes just the same reflection on the face. My text, O Superman, or Being Towards, Transhumanism, Martin Heidegger, Gunther Anders, and Media Aesthetics. How do we begin with this? How do we deal with what Anders argues is our envy, 
or desire to be as the machine is a transhuman. Now we've already read, starting of course, from Descent, volume three, number one, winter 1956, on the world as what we see here, uh, Phantom and Matrix, okay. Phantom and Matrix, as Phantom and as Matrix. That we remember had to do with the question of illusion of ghosts and of things coming to us, so Mount, Mount, mountain not going to Muhammad, we going to the mountain. And we talked about that in terms of film and television and there are obvious parallels with YouTube. But in this text, which appears prior to the text we've already read, that's the same one, Die Welt als Phantom und Matrize, the world as Phantom and Matrix, is concerning or about Prometheische Scham, Promethean shame, that comes from the antiquatedness of humanity, sometimes translated the obsolescence. After that, the chapters Sein ohne Zeit, which is actually on Bertolt Brecht, and concerning the bomb and the roots of our Apocalypse Blindness, very much an important book, very much not available to us. <clears throat> it is the first volume on concerning or about the soul and the age of the second industrial revolution, which we see concerning the destruction of life in the age which is where we find ourselves, except we're probably well advanced beyond that. We got to be in the fourth industrial revolution, as they say, by now. But in 1980, it concerned the destruction of life in the age of the third industrial revolution. So the soul had shifted, very interesting change. Now, different title, sort of cover, same thing, Beck Productions, both of them, this is a paperback edition. <clears throat> we begin with the mysterious Mr. T. Who's Mr. T? We don't know. I am suggesting, I have no evidence for this, except why not? Because it could have been the Times work, could have been Teddy. There's Teddy there, Theodore Adorno, and that's Max Horkheimer there shaking hands. Terribly subversive thing to do today, age of social distancing. But we see here Adorno's house in LA on Kenter Avenue. And Conrad Paul Leisman, who's a Gunther Anders expert, tells us that <clears throat> one of the earliest records of the ideas that would shape on Promethean shame and the multifaceted engagements with human obsolescence are the transcripts, and we have them, of a presentation at a Los Angeles seminar convened by Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer in August 1942. You also have, and you need to keep in mind, that at that time you had a kind of Weimar, as they said, on the Pacific, because Thomas Mann and a good many other expat Germans had not too surprisingly found themselves in a very, very good location with a very good view. That <clears throat> is the quote that you can refer to. He he talks about Promethean shame, the human being and his and his stuff, his tools, his his gadgets, or or Werner Fuld, who writes concerning or between the film and the bomb, the continuity that you can find <clears throat> of Anderson's thinking. That's also Anderson. This is an introductory book written by Leesman. At the time, and it's significant to note, you have rather crazy stuff going on. Uh, aliens are coming down even there, and why not after anti-aircraft uh, uh, maneuvers in World War II, this was certainly something people were used to, and one has anti-aircraft guns combing the sky during the alarm, checking out what's coming. I'm pretty much able to determine that. And Thomas Mann's house, Pacific Palisades. Anders continues, consider the desire of today's human being to become a self-made man, to become a product. And here, what he's tapping into is our envy, our, our competition, our wanting to be as our products are. So he quotes, this is the key. Humans don't want to make themselves, which is what something you know can be attributed to lots and lots of individuals. And Anders' disagreement is it's not that, it's not that they can't put up with anything that wasn't made by them, but rather that they too want to have been fabricated. They want to have been made. TM, you can almost imagine, little trademark. 
like Will Smith's in the iRobot that we might remember. They feel indignant, Anders writes in Promethean Shame, not because they were made by others, by God or gods or nature, doesn't matter, but because they weren't made at all. And as such, they're inferior to all their own fabricated things. So there's competition. What's at stake here is clearly a variant of a classic era, namely a confusion of creator and creation. And that's the point that goes back to Descartes, who, of course, one of his proofs for the existence of God, as he argues, is that he can tell that there has to have been a God because he, Descartes, couldn't be the origin of the idea of God. Because if he, Descartes, could think of God and if he could be his own maker, he, Descartes, would have done a better job. That's one of those arguments. And the expression, Anders takes it back a little further, has its origins in the Confessiones, Augustine's Confessions. Augustine uses it to describe the religious era par excellence, the worship of a creatum, that is, of something that was created in the world, or a worldly artifact, or the pictorial representation of a god in the guises of such a creatum, instead of reserving this worship for the creator who is alone deserving of it. Now, of course, that's a heresy, but it's a common one. It's worshipping false gods. The equivalence of the two mistakes, the two errors, is clear. So when feeling, this is Anders, Promethean shame, humans also prefer what was made over the maker. So they're not, they're not really liking the human beings have made the thing that's made, but you kind of have an envy for the creator thing. Here too, the creation is accorded a higher state of being. Whereas for Augustine, humans belong ao ipso amongst the animal kingdom, they now appear only in their homo faber quality as beings therefore who fabricate things. City of God. Now the confusion of creator with creation in this instance means that the honor humans extend to their things is actually due to themselves. It's kind of a convenient mistake. And to themselves alone. The substitution is here not proof of undue pride, convenient or not, because what's involved is self-degradation. Humanity denies itself the credit it deserves. You don't recognize that you are the one who's done it. Nietzsche also has a similar set of reflections. The mysterious T preoccupies us. We already had one suggestion, probably Teddy, probably Theodore Adorno, hard to say. And that's the T he's talking about, but we don't really know. I don't have tons of evidence. I just consider it nice to think it. Where Adorno says he surely wants existence, does and he wants to be there, but to exist as a natural son rather than as a legitimate product, to exist as someone who was fathered rather than fabricated, to be a human instead of being equal to other precisely functioning, convertible and reproducible machinery. That's what pains him. That's what embarrasses him, that, that he'd prefer to be as he is. Probably he even deems all this to be an original sin, though he doesn't make use of this term and doesn't express his disillusionment in words at all. He goes on to clarify exactly what's involved, noting very importantly that today, then, his day and ours, production processes are made up of so many single and separate steps that Marxian alienation is a kind of romantic dream. Think of Mark Kirkelberg's book on the same theme. These are the workers who actually build the world of products and machines, cannot see these fabrications as the fruits of their own labor because it's so fractionated that there's nothing to see. There's no longer, page 33, any occasion for pride, whether for a single end product or the world of machines and products as a whole. Why? Because no end product shows any sign that it was invested with the specific qualities and achievements of individual workers. It's too atomized. One can only be proud of achievements that bear traces of individuality, that make processes of identification possible. For the workers, the world of machines is no more an object of pride than it is their property to own. They can't take pride in it, and it's not theirs. So not even their work seems to be theirs because they don't know what part of it represents whatever work they may have put into it. This is alienated alienation. So you could see these Maybe they're droids, we're not sure. Google refers to this, Bateman refers to this, we don't know. Somebody, some kind of robot. 
Instead, rather, products are simply there. We encounter them, this is Anders, 33 to 34, primarily as necessary or desirable or superfluous uh, luxury goods, affordable, one affordable, which become mine only after I have bought them. As such, they're likely to be proof of one's own insufficiency than evidence of one's own power. And think of what Chris Bateman was saying, and we were discussing that yesterday. Uh, these days, you can't even buy them and have them. You can buy a kind of license to them and have a little bit until you're told that you will need to renew it or update that or pay a little more money to continue playing. So. In a highly industrialized country, the excess of displayed yet unobtainable products is simply overwhelming. You're constantly showed these possible objects of desire and the shopping mall is thus the permanent exhibition of what one does not have. Now, here we start with one. The whole text, true to the title, is about shame. And that's what he talks about. So he begins with by saying, look, the best known variety is a shame, for example, the shame associated with the genital area become acute in the interaction of humans and become visible as barriers to communication in encounters between human beings. Promethean shame, however, is different, right? It's a form of shame that's felt in response to a thing that should be a T because no human partner is present to make us feel shame. There is likewise, for the most part, no human partner to witness our shame or divine observer or angel casting us out of paradise. Here's Adam and Eve after the fall, same thing. Two, we proceed. Shame, the first observation, crucial, but the second even more. Shame doesn't appear. When you first do something that you're going to call shame, it's something somewhat unconscious, you're unaware of it. It doesn't appear when it sets in. When shame appears, when it's first evident, it does not step onto the stage of visibility, but it takes a step back. There's a kind of, ah, horror. Humans who are ashamed try to conceal their flaw and themselves. So putting, hiding, putting one's hands over one's face is a traditional sign of being ashamed. They are, however, no matter how much you try to put your hand in your face, very, very important, you know, whatever you do, wherever you go, unable to fully realize the desire to sink into the ground and disappear completely. You can't just disappear. From this wavering shame, two peculiar, if you like, dialectical consequences ensue, which explain the invisibility of shame. Third one, two, three, it's possible that T, who was ashamed, right, and that's the, or, or was somehow abashed, he's not really sure, could have been that, he could have been ashamed. In this case, however, Promethean shame isn't and wouldn't be an exciting new thing, but rather the sign of a well-known state of affairs, merely a symptom of the reification, objectification of the human, which has been discussed forever in the text ad nauseum. Okay, to which, this is all his own dialogue. He's self-inventing it and he gives his own counter. This is his repost, his counterpoint. No, he says, it's a sign of much more. What she, maybe Teddy, deems to be the occasion of his shame is precisely not that he has been reified, but the other way around. He's ashamed because he's not been reified and because he's not a thing. That's also what the term think shame, <clears throat> which is the first candidate that, Anders had presented, is out of the question. A new second level in the history of the reification of human beings has been reached with this response of feeling shame at what? Not being a thing. Humans now acknowledge the superiority of things, bring themselves into line with them, and welcome their own reification. Okay, so if we go on to that, we're looking at this question. An example for the endorsement of reification, makeup, as a reification of self, for girls, Anders says it's, think of the 50s when this should be more true, but it's still true to this day. It's out of the question to go out in public without makeup. You have to, sometimes we say this, you have to put your face on before you go out. This doesn't only mean, he says, however, right? Think of Eleanor Rigby, she keeps her face in a jar by the door, who is it for? It's not just that, he says, and this is well before 
the Beatles write the song, Eleanor Rigby, to show themselves in a scruffy or unadorned state, maybe as their mothers or grandmothers before them. No, the pivotal point is when, that is in what state of adornment they feel attractive, just what do they need to have done? When are they deemed to be well turned out? When do they believe that they have no reason to be embarrassed? Answer, once they have, transform themselves into things. Once they look, as close as possible to an airbrushed ideal of excellence or perfection, perfectly made up like as many people as they can find in the magazine or on YouTube. He shifts right here from the ladies to the gents, you could say, the Air Force cadets. And his example is the expression, humans are deserting the camp of their, to the camp of their machines. He wants to figure that out and what was meant by that. His example comes from this. An American Air Force instructor teaches his cadets that humans, this is a caution, in their natural state are faulty constructions when measured against the tasks they face. Regardless of whether the instructor was joking or serious, doesn't matter, a better attestation of the desertion in question couldn't be thought up. And it can't be imagined because humans can only be considered constructions, faulty ones even, once they're classed as machines. Only if you begin to think of the human being as a machine, the animal is machine. Can you even write, as Norbert Wiener writes, this whole discussion of cybernetics? But you've got to have first the idea that what you've got is machine. The man is the machine. The animal is the machine. It's all a machine. And then it's a good one or it's a faulty one. It is only, Anders says, when the category machine has become universally applicable and is deemed all-inclusive, can that which wasn't constructed be reinterpreted as faulty construct. Notice here that at issue isn't the idea of humans as machines that exist alongside other machines. That's not what the Air Force instructor is thinking. Rather, humans, understood as machines, bad ones, exist for the sake of machines which they are therefore supposed to support. So to that extent, he's considering this Air Force instructor, the humans as working parts of machinery already built. That means parts of already specified blueprints for future technology, which they should fit into to be part of it. Think of this as a part of a ground plan or schema for Top Gun. As such, he calls humans faulty, which means fitting badly, inappropriate, not measuring up. That means not made to suitable standards. And Anders goes into some details of what's gonna be involved, even using centrifuges to kind of get people into line so that they might measure up to those standards. All right. The next point of view might be to consider the story of Icarus. Icarus, of course, as you know, is the son of Daedalus. Daedalus, one of the ancestors of, of, of Socrates. You might remember that from reading the Euthyphro, where Daedalus would sell these great st statues he made them, but he could sell them again and again because the statues would always, after he sold them, wake up, as it were, like the machines waking up and come back in the night to his workshop so that he could sell them again. So if you wanted to keep a Daedalus purchase, you really needed to chain it down. Icarus is a different story. Icarus was Daedalus's son and things came to difficult times with Daedalus, but he had a way out. He was hemmed in on all sides. And so he made wings. We know the story of wings from one of the first science fiction stories we have called The True Story. Alethe de Agamata by Lucian, and where the hero constructs these great wings to climb up to the heavens to be with the gods or to have converse with them. And this is the way, the trick that Daedalus also intends to use to escape his enemies. But he tells his son, don't fly too close to the sun. If you do, there will be problems. But Icarus wasn't listening. What? What kid listens to his father and he already knew that he'd fly so high, he already understood, he didn't have to read the instruction manual, none of that. And of course, it turned out that when he did fly too close to the sun, the sun's rays too strong melted the wax, dissolved his wings, and down he fell. Very bad. So 
That wouldn't be the worst description of humanity today, and the Air Force instructor would subscribe to this and agree that humans are, just as Icarus was, the saboteurs, just as Icarus was, of their own achievements. He didn't get to inherit his father's achievements because he fell to earth and perished. For sure, they're not saboteurs in the sense that they would voluntarily harm their machines. And that's an important point. What he says, and since he's a big involved is in the anti-nuclear uh, power, the uh, armaments movement, despite all those weapons of destruction in existence, no such idea of getting rid of the weapons has ever crossed their minds. So you might go to war against someone who might have those weapons, but you wouldn't go to war and seize their weapons and destroy them. Very interesting. That's never really happened. So the sabot, the saboteur, the destruction is always in another constellation. It's not really contra the machines. It's really for the sake of their own rights to work as we already saw that. So sabotage, as W.D. Haywood says, means to push back, pull out, or break off the fangs of capitalism. That's the point, no more fangs. Humans, however, as Anders says, have never been more selfless toward any other entity than toward their machines, kinder than to animals kinder than to the environment, they are saboteurs because they, the living ones, are rigid and unfree. They, it's the problem is with them. Dead things, on the other hand, are dynamic and free. Humans are saboteurs by accident because as natural products, as born bodies, they're too emphatically defined to keep up with the daily changing world of machines. That's why they're faulty constructions, a world which makes a mockery of all self-determination. Now, we talked a little bit with regard to Gunkel about robot rights. There's much more to say, and there'll be more debate in the, I think, I fear, in the years to come. Also, Kate Devlin. But here, in 1956, all Anders is interested in is thinking about possibilities, dreaming, possibilities of space travel, unmanned rocket ships where you send out such satellites, but with certain kinds of messages, because the hope is that there would be a notice return to sender. We still have some of this with our SETI research, where we hope that alien intelligences will have nothing better than to apply to us over the light years, which is an interesting kind of optimism. Or he goes on to continue with a different image. The lame father, that would be us, that would also be Daedalus, sees himself forced to give them a boomerang-like point to carry on their journey so that when they begin to return, where the mail would kind of come back, making up of questionnaires overflowing with question marks. And again, that notice returned to sender. But it's already happening of itself. Once again, mail that's tasked to return to Earth completed to tell the story of what he, the human being himself, would have liked to have learned along the way if only he'd been able to take part. And of course, at that time, that was just a dream. Although October 3rd, 1942, if we believe that that was roughly the time this text was composed when these space rockets were being launched with all those mechanized return to sender notes. And then what would be the first Artificial satellites, that's Sputnik, launched on the 4th of October, right, a couple of significant years later, by Russia, Sputnik artificial satellites. Section 5 then, this gave this claim, the human being of today tries to escape this calamity by the means of physiological synchronization with machines, with his machines, that's to say, by the means of human engineering, same terms that Heidegger uses in Gelassenheit a year before, the well, year before 56, but sometime after, if you want to think of that in this context, as Liesman is arguing, the extreme perversion of supply and demand. So if we go on to the next page, notice the same, come back to the same schema of rhythm and contest. For the man of today, it's of course out of the question to accept the stubbornness and inadaptability of the human body and to settle once and for all for human inferiority and retardation. He has to do something. His dream is naturally to become equal to his deities, the machines, or put more accurately, to be one and entirely part of them. Homologumenosein. As a Molossian hymn, which 
is the kind of hymn that Anders writes with the rhythm he invents. If only we could succeed to shed our burden and stand like machine shafts neatly slotted into others, as post this is with posthesis most intimately bound, then our defect would be overcome, our shame would be unknown. If this could still be granted us, if this favor still could be bestowed, no sacrifice in this world would be for us too much to lag. Now, I have a different rendering that uh, I have already published, and this is uh, Christopher John Muller's rendering, which is quite good. Notice, however, that the emphasis on the Molossian is identified. That's a Molossian hymn. It's supposed to be that kind of machine rhythm. Uh, and here, the reference, blissful co-substantiality with technological instruments, meaning that we can be one and the same. We can have that mind meld. We can have chips. We can have body parts switch to switch in and switch out. There is a film, and I'll try to post a little link to a YouTube a version of this, Autrement la Molusia, which of course is a play on Anders' name, Autre, uh, Autrement in French. And you have differently, you hear how it sounds, Molusia, Nicholas Ray in France in 2012. It's kind of very creative type film, as you can imagine it would be. But here is the book which he couldn't get published no matter his efforts to do so in his lifetime. The Molusia Catacomb, the Molusian Catacombs, and that was published in uh, the Year of His Death uh, by C.H. Beck, his publisher. I think it was a little unkind of them. Very difficult to put into English. Why? Not because it's impossible to translate. It's not the case. But because it's bound to its times. It was an ironic, very creative literary effort to have a commentary on the Zen Nazi era, which, if you're not publishing it during that time, doesn't make sense. It would be like publishing a very sarcastic sort of subversive video film or anything you like about the current pandemic if you waited uh, some, oh, 50 years to publish it, right? And that's, of course, what happened here. So there it is, but it's a little late. On page 40, we continue, for humans, true integration into machinery is no more possible than real competition amongst equals. Machines are once and for all ontologically superior to beings who are born. This doesn't mean, however, that humans could wash their hands in their creaturely innocence and let the matter rest, or that they would even want to do so. Okay. We want to continue that because we're going to go, uh, not immediately, but in a uh, a week, week and a half or so to Agamben and Agamben's writings. These have already been published in some parts uh, in Italian and in German and in French and in English online. This is a now corrected and wonderful translation. Where are we now? The epidemic as politics. And that becomes related to the same functionality because 43 we see what was applied to humans yesterday is now reserved for the machine. Its potentials are nurtured. It is now a duty to give it to our free hand. So think of robot rights. This is the key. The stifling of its potential has become an immoral deed. How dare you practice lodism and so on. Machines are the gifted talents of today. That's where the promise will be. Some of us even asked some questions on some of the discussion board. Do, do we, should we, maybe we should get our AI to solve some of our problems for us. And wouldn't that then be a solution? Good question. Here, however, his question is that no matter what it is, the machine is always going to give, be given a free reign. It will always be given its head. Even the inherent potential of the H-bomb, the Wunderkind amongst machines is held to be sacrosanct. 43 to 44, the next page, as diverse as the excuses for the existence of the bomb may be, a good part of the vehemence with which protests against its existence are met can be explained by the indignation at the fact that there are humans who take the liberty to oppose the maxim, become who you are, vera ver du bist, that is from Pindar as Nietzsche takes that up, who want to nip the organic development of the machine's potential in the bud and block its free development. How dare you oppose this kind of, if you like, gain of function research in atomic bomb development. Very interestingly frightening parallel. 
Today, he continues, even the most dreadful machine can be successfully justified and defended if its critics are suspected of being Luddites, just call them Luddites. And since nothing is easier than just to call them Luddites, this always succeeds. And that's his style. That's the way that he writes, 43 to 44. And you can see that that very critical vision can be sometimes for some people hard to follow. Human engineering is back to that initiation rights of the robotic age. Dehumanization does not, he says, alarm the dehumanized. Somehow no one gets upset about this. Why? Because they've already decided it's not their department. It doesn't belong to their area of responsibility, page 44. Section seven, the attitude of the transformed Prometheus, eubistic humility. Okay. Prideful. Humility, how do we combine those two? Well, we manage. And we manage because, as he says, it'd be a futile exercise to want to retrospectively find a common denominator for questions of what is just as a question is yours, regard to law, and questions of what's done. Question is facti, those things having to do with what is actually done in fact, including those pertaining to things that are done in metaphysical fact, to level the charge that reason was split into these two parts by philosophy, particularly by Kantian philosophy, which established the split once and for all, is he thinks pretty ridiculous. And you can see elements of this already in Paulson, as he says, but he can also find them in Elul. Because of the natural sciences, he goes on to say, page 48, the world has transformed itself for us because God is no longer an issue. Hasn't been since, oh, Hegel, actually, not even Nietzsche, but Hegel. The world is now a thing that's beyond good and evil. Very interesting. Page 48. This is how one might imagine this is an invented dialogue, an invented code a theological account that would reflect on this in the year 2000. So if this was written in 42 and it was published in 56, that's already half a century ahead of time. So he says, because the daimon or makotionist god who condemned humans to machine-like existence or turned them into machines didn't exist, humanity invented one. Yes, humans were even presumptuous enough to cast themselves in the role of this additional deity. They assumed this role, however, only to damage themselves in ways that they could not suffer from any other gods, humans turn themselves into masters, only to find new, a new way to become slaves. So this is the very complicated point, and you can kind of focus on that. We're in charge, but in charge in what way? In charge in a way which requires us to be subordinate to servants of, slaves of, our machines. This is, of course, Marcionist heresy, uh, which posits a kind of equal uh, and opposite world of e of good and, and an equal and opposite world of evil, which is why it's a heresy, uh, is depicted here. And this one monotheistic vision, of course, is also the standard one that we have. But Anders goes on to another older tradition, the Titanic vision, he says, we've usually associated the figure of Prometheus with Ubris. And we already saw that Mark Kirkelberg has a book on uh, romantic ideas of cyborg, and that would be Frankenstein, uh, Mary Shelley. Uh, but that on page 50, uh, as we see it in Prometheanism, for the last 175 years, from Goethe, by Shelley, the Shelley, and Ibsen to Sartre's Les Mouches, our fathers treated Prometheus allegorically, and until recently, we did the same. So it used to just be an allegory, what is it now? <clears throat> if we ask ourselves whether this figure, Prometheus, still has validity and allegorical significance for the representation of our contemporaries who conduct human engineering, that word again, we arrive at the following ambivalent answers, page 50. There's our Prometheus. And remember that in Goethe, it is Prometheus who fashions or forms the human out of clay and steals fire from heaven to give to that creation. The second section eight, <clears throat> inferiority of human beings, is that they die, right? They perish easily. They die and are excluded from the process of industrial reincarnation. You can't fix them. You can't replace them. You can't switch them out. The, this is then the human malaise of being unique. That's page 51. He goes on 
just to look at this question a little bit more, here's our <clears throat> Kale Lash's reproducibility in culture jam and the need to kind of be able to trade, mark, device, and sign. We have 51 to 52. He lists exactly what that means. The things we make are not immortal in the strict sense of the word. So fabricated things don't really have that quality unless we build that into them. The durability and shelf life of our preserved foods, our frozen scrambled eggs, vinyl records or light bulbs, is limited, things can go bad. In most cases, however, it's we humans who have allocated mortality to our products and have limited their life expectancy plan, obsolescence, that's also Blade Runner, uh, in order to secure steady or even increasing demand for them, for example. It's no good to make, <clears throat> as Tesla could have made, and as in fact, uh, Thomas Edison could make a light bulb that burns forever. It's just that you can't really sell a lot of light bulbs like that in a sort of one-off products. Only, page 52, our own mortality is not of our making. It alone has not been calculated. Because of this, it's a cause for shame. So what we're ashamed of when we have this Promethean shame is the fact that we're not titans. We're not Olympian gods. We're not any kind of gods. We're just mortal beings. And you see, this is the occasion for embarrassment. Point which is useful, we might remember Postman, we can certainly think about the existence of serial products. In a contrast, this is Anders who writes, the great fire which destroyed the library of Alexandria, no page was actually burnt when thousands of pages were reduced to ashes in the course of Hitler's book burnings in 1933. There's a little technology which makes that impossible, that's Gutenberg. So why? Every page had hundreds of thousands of identical siblings because once you've printed the page, you can print, <clears throat> once you've set it up, you've set it and typeset it, any number of pages at libitum, and that is in fact what was done. So he continues, <clears throat> as ignominious as the intentions of the arsonist were, and as ominous the gesture of his hand, which betrayed the fact that it would soon commit more than paper to the flames, at this stage, his acts of annihilation were still totally farcical. In the midst of the jeering crowd, you can see them here dancing around the pious books. They've also danced on scene. These would be the ghosts, a featherlight group of hecklers teasing, which the flames couldn't touch, even while being scattered to the winds. These are the book icons, the spirits of the books. This book prototypes would proclaim, go ahead, burn our copies, burn them. Us, you cannot burn. And today, these supposedly incinerated books live again and do so in thousands upon thousands of copies. You have lots and lots of copies of all the books the Nazis burned. Whereas by contrast, because they were one-offs, the books that were burned in Alexandria are lost to history. This was just a public relations gesture. It wasn't real. That factor of what's real, virtual, reproduced, Gutenberg manufacturing style continues. And we might remember just to, to kind of connect this uh, with some of our previous readings, Ryan's speech, even if we may not have been to this page, University of Coimbra General Library for a glitch detail of the Pugio Fide manuscript, which you kind of can't read here because it kind of doesn't show up. And you might've seen an image like this before on a web page, perhaps. It's what it's supposed to look like, that same detail of the 13th century Pugio Fidei manuscript by Romondo Marti. David Bell, talking about the bookless future, talks about the way we like to read. We, start, we quoted already Stefan Hagel, who says, very interestingly, that, you know, even when it comes to ancient Greek manuscripts, even if the computer reproductions are bad ones. It's still great to be able to use them. It kind of gives wings to the feeling of your research powers. So what powers are those? It's a strategic power, targeted power. You can feel empowering in that sense because instead of surrendering to the organizing logic of the book, you're free. You can approach it with your own questions and glean just what you want. Okay, that's great. The trouble is the continuation is the same advantage. You're the master, not some dead author. That's the great bit. But that's also the bad bit. Why? 
Information is not knowledge. Searching is not reading. And surrendering to the organizing logic of our book is, after all, the way one learns. Wow, that's a very interesting point. One has to learn, open one's mind, go a little further than one already happens to be or to find oneself. So if we consider this question of searchability, now this is Ryan's speech, to read strategically via text searching, one doesn't need to wait through any unsought surrounding terrain. You don't have to look at anything, but what would you want to look at? And in fact, this is also one of the problems. You may have noticed this when you get to some of the library eBooks that we download, you're only limited to a certain range of text pages and you can't look after or beyond them. So such control represents a significant inversion of power in our experience. We're not really empowered, very interesting. A shift that librarians have come to refer to as a loss in serendipity. You, you can't happen upon things you didn't expect. The reductive reading of a digital world, one in which text has become mechanically searchable, is a reading mediated principally through data. And of course, that's not really reading and certainly isn't really amenable to hermeneutics. No matter how many times, and Yukui has tried to write about this, you use the word hermeneutics. So this new significance, this is speech again, tracking the code. We have that text. We look, talked about it already. This new significance consists of the fact that it embodies a kind of irreducible idiosyncrasy that's virtually impenetrable with the tools of targeted reading. So you not, you, you, you're, you're losing it and you can't see that you've lost it. That's the most extraordinary thing. What can't you see? You can't see the manuscript. You don't have access to the actual manuscript, no matter how much digital access you have. Why? Because the manuscript to be adequately researched must be touched, smelled, read, received, interpreted in order to be appreciated and understood. It can be appreciated fully only by means of a give and take relationship and in that relationship, even if you have full access to it, it's always gonna be partly elusive. And that's what having the manuscript in your hands lets you know, this is an opaque text. This has secrets still, something you kind of can forget when you have digital access. We'll go back a little bit here to this next point. We have a nice illustration. Any reproduction, including even the most detailed digital rendering is able to preserve only a vestige of the manuscript's real dynamic nature, which exceeds you. Like a deep sea creature that perishes and decomposes when forced up to the light and from the low pressure of the sea surface, the manuscript exists on its own terms in its native habitat in a world in which the reader isn't in full control and is only limited understanding. There's all kinds of things you don't know about it. And that takes us to, to, we're not going to be able to discuss that right now, but we'll come back to this a little bit later, because in about uh, less than, I think, two weeks, people should be presenting or thinking about the papers they're writing for this class. And when you do that, you're going to need to draw on some of these supplementary uh extra research texts and Baudrillard could be one of them speaking of simulacra or system as could a little speech, etc. These products back to Anders, oh, their existence store ideas. They've come into the world as imitations. That's the point of the simulacra or imprints of what simulacra? Prototype models, blueprints or master copies. None of the things produced in this way now makes or can make the arrogant claim of being itself. It's just one of many other kinds that are exactly identical to it. I can't say this, I love my toaster because you can replace your toaster with an exact copy of the same. None's individual and singular. And that's an interesting point. Why? Because everything they are can also be gotten in their replacement items. So if the items, he's not a fool, produced to an unchanged model are kept in stock, if they don't go extinct, if they don't go, uh, if they're not made redundant out of production, uh, they can be replaced. And therefore, the only limit is going to be how much money you have, whether or not the thing you, it, possess can be mortal or immortal. For the man who's flush with cash, each thing can reincarnate itself in a new one. And it's very interesting that money is still part of what will be the immortality business, which we're expecting to have in the new brave world. So 
these are some old things we used to have totally replaceable things and this is kind of a graveyard of such computer monitors and uh, little computers. Some of these are complete, complete computers, not just monitors, which is kind of scary. This prospect of reincarnation only ends, right? When the idea of the thing dies, when its make is dropped in favor of another one, the thousand copies produced from the blueprint of that particular make then of course disappear. And they're gonna disappear gradually. They go to maybe computer <clears throat> museums of which there are not a lot, very interesting. You have a lot of computer garbage, not a lot of computer museums, page 53. Obsolescence is that notion. And here we have, it goes, I found the very first one that only goes up to six plus. So you really got the better ones, the seven and the eight, and then the kind of very disappointing 12, not even space for that on a screen. Planned obsolescence, like the <clears throat> communicator, like from Star Trek a vision of the Nokia cell phone, some of them are coming back or cassette, maybe you can't tell that's except that's what that's supposed to be. They're all meant to be looking unhappy <clears throat> or deeper. Uh, those things are eclipsed. And obsolescence is a standard notion. That's what Anders is talking about. And the idea is that you design it that way, like, like, like a uh, inkjet printer, right? Where you spend a certain amount on ink, and then of course, probably get too much ink. <clears throat> and you wanna be careful about that because at a certain point, the printer will seize, cease to function and you'll need to buy another printer. And probably that printer will be out and they sneakily introduce whole new types of ink which means your ink will be useless and your printer along with it. The example that he goes on to give is a little romantic and a little sad. Romantic because in the 40s and the 50s, you could visit friends in hospital who didn't have long to live. This is a stage thing because it's look as if it's a cheerful kind of thing. <clears throat> but that's not the conversation that Anders has with his friends when he asks and he knows it's silly. How are you? He knows it's not good. The guy's dying and the guy knows he's dying. Well, how are you? <clears throat> and to which the person he speaks to adds a rhetorical question to counter mine. Well, can they preserve us? Kind of sarcastic fellow. The word they referred to the doctors preserves the bottle of fruits. He wanted to say, can they perhaps turn us into preserves like, like marmalade? I said, no. I'm gonna go on. And he continued, spare men, they haven't got either. So his understanding was that it would be nice if he could be changed out as if he were a car in a shop for a new make and model of the same, spare men. Okay, spare men, I asked, not understanding. He elaborated, well, don't they have spare things for everything? So. We never list here what's replacement, how long it lasts from shoulders and of course other joints, hips and so on, knees and ankles. And those are the kind of parts they're able to replace or change out and those themselves will last a certain period of time. And ideally, eventually, remember the discussion that Bostrom and Yudkowsky had, you can upload your consciousness, your mind, and then perhaps you don't need your body because perhaps if you put your consciousness in the cloud, there's no need for the a uh, physical, physical version that would be, that'd be you. But that's not how Anders continues. He continues by saying, okay, let's be real. You're not irreplaceable, not in from one point of view. Spare men are always available. Why? Because everyone is merely a part and an actor in a labor process. So from a certain point of view, that conclusion is only true, however, from the same institutional perspective. It is and shared by individuals themselves. Right? The fact that you're replaceable at your job is not how you look at yourself. Our already mentioned patient, for example, testifies to this one on page 55. He didn't complain about his replaceability. He grieved over his irreplaceability. Right? He would have liked to have been replaceable. That's the point. He would have liked to have been able to be changed out for a new self so that he would be preserved. Very interesting set of reflections, 55. Now, cloning is what he's talking about then, and it's already available. As the section nine continues, you will attempt to escape this second calamity through economia, right? Try to get onto that. 
What if it happens already on film? You're on, one is immortal on film. So very important point. In a certain sense, he says, page 57, the star is even immortal, was still alive. That would be the immortal Garbo, for example. And it's not known, by the way, of all flesh. She's younger than she is because the majority of her pictures feature the eternalized version of her actual self. That is the only version that counts commercially. The one <clears throat> that portrays the divine and wrinkle-free appearance from her youth. We cannot imagine that these are pictures of the same person. Page 57. Shame, section 11. As a disruption, we're back now to continuing a reflection on shame. The expression ontic endowment, the I is ashamed of being itself, the I is ashamed of being an I. There's a reference here, excuse me, the it, <clears throat> to Sigmund Freud, S, wo S war, soll ich werden, where it was the I should become this dynamic between the self and its tension with, with something underlying the self. Which he proceeds to explore. Now, Anders had two parents, both of whom were psychologists, uh, uh, William Stern, the inventor of the IQ test, uh, and Clara Stern, who wrote about child psychology. So Anders knows something about psychology and he really knows something about shame. So well, let's pay attention here. What then he asks is shame. It's a reflexive act. Okay, that's the definition. One is ashamed of oneself. That is, it involves a reference to self. Shame is something you feel uh, yourself about yourself. Shame, however, this is an interesting constellation, <clears throat> B, is a reference to self that fails. This is a reflexive act, does not fail only occasionally. You can do remembering yourself, you can forget yourself, all those things, but rather it fails categorically and fundamentally. So <clears throat> it's categorical because those who are ashamed encounter themselves at once as identical and as not self-identical. It's me, it is me after all. So here's this question of shame. And Nietzsche writes something very similar where he talks about a context between memory and at the same time, pride. And pride, he thinks, is really what comes in here because memory says, you did that thing. Pride says, you could, I me? Mean, no, I, I, I would never have done such a thing. And then Nietzsche says, you, they fight it out for a little bit. And after a while, memory loses, right? So it's me. It is me after all. Shame then, <clears throat> D, 63, as a consequence of this, the act never stops. It never comes to an end because the one who's ashamed cannot get over the contradictory encounter. Shame is never over and done with either. So you've really got to forget, but that forgetting is a suppression and that suppression isn't going to work. It's going to come back, the return of the repressed. Okay, so in this and the traits F and G, shame resembles astonishment, shock, surprise. F continues so much so that it actually forfeits its quality of being a reflexive act and it generates into a state. That's very bad. That could be a depression, terrible thing. And he says, and she does not, however, become a state of equilibrium, a stationary mood using the Heideggerian language, but an oscillating state of irritation and disorientation. It turns into a condition that seems to perpetually begin afresh, even if one already deems oneself to be in the thick of it in grief. Shame is an interference in processes of self-identification. It's a condition of being distraught and confused. For Sturtis, it's a kind of very perpetuating problem. Okay, now that takes us to towards the end of the uh, sections that we are reading to this double intentionality of shame. So this is where it becomes a little theological. You can see this is on the soul uh, in the second age uh, of the industrial revolution on the soul spiritual aspect. In contrast to most of the harmless acts that occasionally, usually occasionally, are the objects of psychological and phenomenological investigation, shame essentially entails double intentionality. It's not solely directed towards its normal intentional object, the perceived flaw, but also simultaneously toward, right? It's turned toward an authority before which the one who's ashamed feels shame. That means it entails a quorum, it entails a before which 
And that's, of course, the problem. Koram, that's the Latin, is defined, Christopher John Miller tells us, gives us the definition, he translates the definition that Anders gives us, to be in the presence of, to be before, for example, the eyes of the public, the law, or an authority. So this is Christopher John Miller's translation. Lots articulation, explanation for us. So we're grateful to that. But of course, that's what Anders proceeds himself to try to gloss himself. Karam Deo refers to the being in the presence of or before one's God. That includes three, the articulation, because what makes sense of this notion of apotropaic or negative intentionality, the authority is unsolicited. You didn't ask for it, often even one unwanted. It's not actually intended, it's evaded. The intentional turn towards this authority is in fact a turn away from it. The intentional reference is a rejection. It's all negative. It's negatively intentional. So you see the hand which sort of blocks the before which. And Anders' first dissertation was supervised by, uh, as, 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 as we see here, a text written with, and it was regard to a categorical states with Edmund Rousseau. He studies with Martin Heidegger and he's not able to actually write a habilitation, but he has something that explicates, this is his gloss on Koram, what it is before. It's not specific to shame, he reminds us, even though it's particularly evident with regard to shame. Rather, it's a trait that belongs to all social acts. Example, to boast in front of someone else. You really can't boast all by yourself. You've got to put things on Facebook if you want to be. Uh, get attention for those things. So, Koram Deo, before God, Koram Deo, Koram Mundo, before the world. Koram, he says, is probably an element that can be discovered maybe in every act, however hermit-like it may be. Even if one's oblivious of this, even if the act takes place in private, it's doubtful that there's an act that doesn't make reference to a particular social word. You see the relevance of Heidegger, the word is Mitwelt, that he uses, on which it counts, and before which it takes place, or wants to pass unobserved. Either it wants attention or it doesn't want attention, wants to pass without a mark. It's the same. So the conception of consciousness, he ends our reflection, or we're going to be ending with this, in the classical phenomenology of Husserl, had to closely border on solipsism because this phenomenology, without being clear about its own principle of selection, almost exclusively restricted itself to the analysis of acts it didn't openly imply this Koram. And to that extent, he echoes with Heidegger, the need for what Heidegger also adds in the very beginning pages of a being and time, this reference to the with world. And that's, of course, what we read. Notice, and we'll stop at this point, notice that uh, you should take maybe tomorrow or the day, just to write a very, very short uh, analysis of this lecture and the reading on uh, Promethean shame. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about the different matter of the man in the white suit. I have gotten, I have, I've, I've gotten uh, the library to purchase a streaming version of the man in the white suit, great fun to watch that, but also the discussion of that for next week. And because Zoom cooperated in making this a little bit later than it should be, you can certainly take the weekend to get that to me, to try to get that to me, however, by Sunday or Monday, uh, as, uh, as you can. I'll see you next week.